Hello, and uh, thank you very much for, for what I could tell, although I didn't understand it. It was a kind introduction. And a special thanks to the organizer for the very professional work ahead of the conference, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. So as was said, my name is Karianne Dangsland, and I'm a human geographer at the University of Bergen in Norway. And uh, the past 15 years, I've worked with... Um, migration and integration and urban planning, mostly in the Norwegian and German context. And I was asked today to talk about waiting and time in the context of migration, and I happily agree to that task. So both in research and policy settings, migration is mostly approached as a spatial phenomenon, that is, uh, as a phenomenon of moving through and on space of crossing borders and of regulating migration through spatial measures such as camps and checkpoints and walls. And um, yes, I hope to show today addressing migration through a lens of time and temporality might produce new insights regarding how European states seek to govern and um, uh, steer and regulate migration and about the consequences of prolonged waiting for migrants. And I will argue today, and I will touch upon how uh, present developments towards more temporary forms of refugee protection in Europe make the question of waiting highly pressing politically and ethically. And uh, so my, my talk will be on a quite different subject than, than the talk you've heard um, today so far. And I will base it on research that I have conducted the past years as part of two interdisciplinary and international research projects. And these projects are novel in the sense that they uh, are kind of interdisciplinary work between geographers and anthropologists on the one hand and legal scholars and lawyers on the other hand. They are also novel because they approach migration exactly from the perspective of time and temporality. So the first project I will draw upon is a project called WAIT, or Waiting for an Uncertain Future, the Temporalities of Irregular Migration. And that project was carried out between 2017 and 2020. And as part of that project, I did one year ethnographic fieldwork in Germany, in Hamburg, which I will draw a lot upon in my speech today give you an example of what it means to work ethnographically, as we geographers and anthropologists call it. I will also base my talk on a more recent and ongoing research project I'm working on. And this project is called Temporary Protection as a Durable Solution, the Return Turn in Asylum Policies in Europe, or short, temporal. And this project explores the turn towards more temporary forms of protection in the UK, Germany, Denmark, and Norway. But to guide you into the topic of my presentation today, this more kind of abstract topic of time and temporality, I will start by telling you a story from my fieldwork in Hamburg in 2017. This story would illuminate in several ways how my time is at stake in migration and in migrants' experiences. It also serves the purpose of providing you with an insight into the methodologies I use when I work and on which I base my research. So, as mentioned, my, my research in the WAIT project was based in Hamburg. And at the time of my fieldwork, German public institutions and NGOs were um, very much marked by the increase of asylum seekers to the European Union in 2015. Germany took a leading role in the member states' negotiations of the European Union's response to what is often called the long summer of migration. And it also took a leading role in the reception of asylum seekers. Between in 2015 and 2016, Germany received more than 1.2 million applications for asylum. And as, as a response to that, a proliferation of local initiatives developed in Germany in support of newly arrived migrants. And the German response was acclaimed, partly in international media through the notion of Willkommenskultur, cultural welcome. 
Yet Germany also responded to the situation through a number of legal reforms. And between 2015 and 2017, the German parliament passed more than 20 new bills in the field of migration and asylum. And on a general basis, these bills raised the threshold for asylum, increased the use of temporary residency permits, and aimed to accelerate the pace of asylum and deportation procedures. And as such, these developments were consistent with broader developments in migration regulation and asylum policies at the level of the European Union in those years. So my research in Hungary was based on a cluster of methods. I interviewed state bureaucrats, NGOs, and lawyers and activists working in the field of migration. And I also conducted participatory observation in several asylum camps. And you see one of them here on the screen. And, and doing that, I used a method that we geographers often call deep hanging out. That meant that I hung out with migrants um, in their everyday lives over a year to learn and to gain knowledge about um, the topic of my investigation. And two of the persons I met during field work was Fatima and Alan, and their two kids. And these people came from Afghanistan and they had lived two years in Norway before they came to Germany. And the reason I met them was that their lawyer asked me to translate some of their documents into German. And the Norwegian authorities had rejected their asylum application in 2017, and they then fled to Germany to avoid deportation to Afghanistan. And they knew that German authorities, in contrast to Norway, Norwegian authorities, did not at that time deport families back to Afghanistan. And the story I will narrate to you um, took place in their uh, asylum camp barrack in Hamburg, a uh, space similar to the one you see here on the screen. And that day we had tea on the floor and Fatima put out biscuits and uh, chocolate for us. And when we sat there enjoying the sweets, Fatima told me about how she feared she would be sent back to Norway. Within the ne next six months due to the European Dublin regulation. And I guess most of you are familiar with this law. It is a European Union law that determines which member state is responsible for an asylum claim and provides for the transfer or the deportation, as Fatima would call it, um, of an asylum seeker to the responsible state. And in Fatima and Alan's case, Norway was responsible for their application. And in accordance with the Dublin regulation, the German authorities had six months on their hands to send the family back to Norway. After these six months, the family would be legally entitled to a new asylum application process in Germany. And I want to read you a passage from our conversation on the floor that day. The lawyer told me these are risky times. Germany is doing everything fast now, Fatima said. She talked about the fear of deportation back to Norway before the six months period was over and showed me some pills she had gotten to help her with her feelings. Her feelings were bad that day, she said. Yesterday, the date on the calendar showed that they had been eight years in Europe. Yesterday, we had been eight years in Europe. That maybe made me cry. Before I had so much energy, now I do not have any left. I've used up all my energy, she said. So time is central in several ways to this account uh, from the barrack uh, of this family. For one, the account illustrates how states seek to regulate migration through deadlines and time limits set in uh, uh, asylum regulation. It indicates the role of acceleration, of speeding up as a central instrument of asylum governance. Notice uh, Fatima's fear of going of how Germany is doing everything fast. Her word illustrates the role of speed and tempo of bureaucratic decision-making for producing outcomes for migrants. And furthermore, the story indicates how living with insecure legal status and, and security regarding the future has profound, might have profound effects on migrants. In Fatima's case, she says that these years in Europe, these eight years, have used up all her energy. 
So now I will return to the story of Fatima and Alan several times during my lecture. And I've structured the re reminder of my lecture as follows. So first, I want to say a couple of words regarding how I understand irregularized migration, which is the focus of my research, as the title of this lecture says. And, and by doing this, I hope to illuminate the relevance of my lecture within the conference that focuses mostly on legal migration pathways. And secondly, I will present how waiting has been approached in social science literature before I uh, discuss how context-specific wait situations of waiting are being produced within the present migration governance system in Europe. And at the end, I will discuss some of the effects of prolonged waiting for migrants. So, my research in the WAIT project, the focus particularly on irregularized migration. And the term irregularized migration, as I use it, comprises people who enter or dwell on state territory without formal authorization. The, the term thus comprises a wide range of categories of people, including those who remain on state, state territory after having overstayed their visa, people who had had their residence revoked or asylum seekers and who have had their resident, their application rejected, or also people who just enter a territory without uh, applying for residency permit or asylum. These are all categories of people whose presence on their territory is somehow contested or legally precarious. And I also include asylum seekers in my definition of irregularized migrants because being an asylum seeker is a temporary condition. It is legally precarious, and, and asylum seekers often move between statuses, as the uh, st as the story of Alan and Fatima illustrates. And I want to be specific that I use the term irregularized migration rather than only irregular migration, as is a normal policy term. And by doing that, I want to stress that I understand irregularized migration as produced through law and bureaucratic practices. Take, for instance, the case of Alan and Fatima. Their status of legality in Europe would vary according to the different legal and administrative practices in Norway and Germany in 2017. And research also documents how migrants who enter through legal labor migration pathways might find themselves ending up in situations of irregularity when their visa expires or when they lose their work, for instance. And the COVID situations really made that um, situation very visible in Europe, as many labor migrants lost their jobs. And... On the other hand, irregularized migrants might find ways to regularize their stay after arrival and after rejected asylum application. For instance, Germany in 2016 opened new pathways towards regularity for rejected asylum seekers who managed to find work or enter into vocational training programs. And these examples illuminate how migrants' legal status is a product of specific socioeconomic and uh, legal contexts, and it is open for questioning the dichotomy in policy between regular and irregular legal and illegal migration, as I see it. And having made that point, I also wish to add that existing research on what is called legal labor migration in 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 the policy field also illustrate how waiting really shapes often the lives of legal labor migrants. For instance, when people are waiting for a more permanent form of residency permit or for family re reunification. As such, the issues I bring up also has relevance for the policy field of uh, legal labor migration. So, but it's time to, to enter the topic of waiting and time. Let me start with this picture. I took this picture once I joined Fatima to the immigration authorities in Hamburg. People go to the immigration authorities to renew their residency papers, to inquire about the asylum process or to have their deportation suspended. 
And as you see here, Fatima is holding up a um, queue ticket, CO33. And while well, you see on the screen that the CO35 and CO34 has been called, her number has not yet occurred and she is still waiting. And I guess we all have experiences with similar situations, waiting in a public office, wondering why we are not called or when we are due, or perhaps some of us work behind the desk, watching, calling and encountering the people waiting. And in today's societies, as you know, time is carefully used as a resource to be allocated, budgeted and managed. And waiting in this societal context it's mostly understood as something that limits productive uses of time. Waiting equals wasted time and is associated with personal and social costs. And in the context of public policies and institutions, then, waiting is often approached as an unwanted byproduct of an overburdened bureaucracy or in terms of bureaucratic inefficiency. And, and waiting understood as... Um, unwanted feature of system inefficiency was indeed a topic in the legal and policy reform work in, the, in Europe in response to the increased arrivals of people in 2015. These arrivals manifested in queues of people in city streets, at border crossing points, and in train stations. And moreover, in, it created long queues within a cell um, processing. And media politicians and policymakers discussed waiting in terms of personal costs for migrants, their health and well being, and in per terms of social and economic costs for their receiving society. And this discussion of waiting, integration, and health is here illustrated in this um, um, case from the Denmark, from Denmark here on the screen. And an old spoken aim of legal changes in the asylum system at the level of the European Union, as well and its member states following um, 2015, has been to lower waiting time and accelerate asylum processing. However, I will argue that to approach waiting as a symptom of institutional inefficiency is not sufficient if we are to understand the role that waiting plays in present migration governance in Europe. So to make this argument, I will make a detour to back to the immigration offices in Hamburg. I stayed with Fatima and Alan in that room for several hours that day. And at one point, uh, Alan got upset. He, um, he called the guard and shared his frustration in a loud voice. And after this episode, I went out to the stairway to make a phone call and the guard approached me and he apologized for the long wait. And he said, and this is his words, that the first line workers were punishing Alan, making him wait longer because he also raised his voice the last time he was at the office. And what I'm meaning to say with this is that this conversation illuminates how making Alan wait was a way for the first line workers of the immigration authorities to send him a signal regarding his behavior. Time was, uh, one could say, um, used for the sake of discipline. And sociologists and anthropologists have for decades researched waiting as central to how power operates in modern societies. In 1974, the sociologist Schwartz made when waiting central to a much quoted study about modern institutions. And he argued that the distribution of waiting time coincide with the distribution of power. So our argument is based on the assumption that it's, if time is a resource, then time is also something that can be used, controlled and unevenly distributed. And based on such understandings of the role of waiting and time in societal institutions, Researchers have explored the role of queuing, for instance, and how states use the suspension of social and political rights in durations of time as a legal and policy instrument. And more than solely as an unwanted effect of imperfect systems, I would argue that in the context of migration governance, waiting should be understood 
in terms of how states control and stretch this time through deadlines and durations of time to manage people's movement and their acquisition of rights. Accordingly, if we set out to unpack the role of waiting in the context of migration, this task should also involve asking questions about how waiting is produced and shaped through law and policy and bureaucracy. And saying this, I'm not primarily thinking about waiting in queue in at an office, which is a more situational form of waiting. Waiting for migrants often take more prolonged forms and really shape their lives in very profound ways. And this is more akin to a kind of existential waiting. And this is what I will focus on in the following. Uh, but firstly, I will try to unpack how waiting is at stake in the efforts that European states take to manage and regulate and steer migration today. And I will do this from a specific perspective, and I will do it by focusing on the turn towards more temporary forms of protection within European asylum policy the previous years. And these are policies that also apply to Fatima and Alan, who actually have the possibility to get their asylum applications reprocessed in Germany in 2018. So, so these are developments in European asylum policies that we research in the Temporal Project. And this is a project that is, has just started and it will go on until 2023. By the notion of temporary protection policies, I aim to capture several parallel legal developments in European asylum governance the past years. And I will substantiate this as I go on. Now I will just uh, briefly mention them. So firstly, the turn towards temporary protection involves downgrading the type of protection provided. For instance, by granting subsidiary forms of protection in order to reduce entitlements. It also involves making permanent residence increasingly conditional on income and language requirements. It involves rolling back of policies that provide a path to longer term residence and enhancing or introducing measures such as protection reviews uh, that require refugees to prove their need for continued protections over and over again. And these changes to eligibility criteria are complemented by intensified efforts to secure return agreements with countries of refugee origin. And I want to note that this is not a new phenomenon. Um, this uh, temporary protection was also used, for instance, in the context of the Balkan crisis in the 1990s. Yet today's practice is novel because, well, the, in the in context of the Balkan crisis, the state responded primarily by creating parallel protection regimes. Today, temporary protection are now really, really more infiltrate the mainstream practice of refugee law in several European countries. And so far, these policies have gained most attention uh, through their implementation in Denmark because of Denmark's decision to revoke the residency status for more than 2,000 Syrians in April this year. And you might have heard about that in the news. This is a picture for one of one mass protest in Copenhagen, Copenhagen in response to this um, development. But um, but although they haven't been most uh, present in Denmark, uh, they are also visible in the German context. And I thought I would substantiate what I'm saying now um, by using the situation of Syrians in Germany as an example. So until 2015. Syrians in Germany were giving refugee protection, mostly in accordance with the Geneva Convention. And their status as convention refugees made her eligible for a residency permit that lasted three years, after which uh, they could apply for a permanent residency permit. From 2015, however, Syrians have been granted the so-called subsidiary protection which is a weaker form of protection with fewer rights attached. And the subsidiary protection has a duration of one year 
after which one might apply for two-year uh, renewal. And first, after five years, a person might apply for a permanent residency permit. And during these five years, uh, the German authorities has the possibility to retry and withdraw the residency permit or the refugee protection. And furthermore, in 2016, the German government introduced a suspension and family re reunification that lasted until 2018, which also introduced a, a long waiting time for migrants waiting to have their family uh, with them. And it should be added that the turn towards more temporary forms of protection also pertains to um, uh, so-called convention refugees. Uh, because since 2016, also people who are granted refugee protection as convention refugees have to wait five years before they can apply for a permanent residency permit. And during this time, the government might retry their cases. So the policies that I've sketched so far impose prolonged waiting on migrants. And more broadly, they illustrate the centrality of time of carving up time in duration and of um, deciding on deadlines, the centrality of such things in how European and how uh, European states actually seek to steer and regulate mobility and the acquisition of rights and the inclusion into various, various sectors of the state. And um, I, th I would argue that in light to, of the turn to more, towards more temporary forms of protection, it is important to understand what the effects of prolonged waiting are for migrants and for their inclusion into different institutions of the state and of the welfare state. And so in the last part of my presentation, I will discuss how prolonged waiting as a condition of life and an experience of time affects migrants' lives and their well-being. And I want to make a cautionary remark before I do that. So waiting is such a prominent feature of our everyday lives and familiar to each and all of us. And in a research context, this familiarity can actually be problematic because as researchers, we risk reproducing, taking for granted the assumptions about waiting when we analyze our material or disseminate our research. And doing this, we might include what is actually at stake when we talk about migration and waiting. So while I will address some effects of waiting, I will also, I also wish to use this opportunity to kind of uh, pre present some new perspectives what is going on when we talk about waiting and how we might actually think about waiting. And I would thought I would start this last section actually by showing you a passage from a movie that was made by um, anthropologist Sharam Koshravi, who was my colleague in the Wait Project, and by the filmmaker Dagmavi Yimer. And the movie addresses the situation of waiting for migrants in Europe. And the main protagonist of this movie is an African man who writes a letter to his son from a refugee shelter in Salusi in Italy. Saluso, sorry, in Italy. And I wish to show you this movie to bring migrants' voices more directly into my lecture. And it should be noted that Koshavi himself is a former irregular migrant in Sweden. And the passage I will show you now opens with a scene where Sharam Kotravi speaks about waiting and the experience of waiting. And for those of you who want to see the whole movie, because this is only a passage, it is, it is, it is possible to find it on YouTube. And you might also ask Kotravi and, and Yimmer to be able to use the video if you would like to. So now you can show the passage from the movie. And this waiting is not an existential waiting, waiting for love, waiting to give birth, waiting for death, but a politicized waiting, a waiting imposed on you by politics. Thank you. 
Pour me rappeler encore mon premier jour à mon arrivée à Salusso, c'était un dimanche. Et je cherchais le lieu où les Africains étaient censés être regroupés. On appelait le lieu Guantanamo. C'était un vrai choc. Quand je suis arrivé à l'entrée, j'ai vu, mais ça, c'est du jamais vu. C'est comme un lieu où il y a eu une catastrophe où les gens sont sinistrés et il faut de l'urgence pour les héberger. Et j'ai vu des tas de personnes, un grand nombre de personnes par-ci par-là, des vélos entassés par à gauche et à droite, des tentes dressées à droite et à gauche. Tous les lieux étaient occupés. Je suis presque arrivé en retard. Ça m'a vraiment piqué le cœur. Ici, nous sommes regroupés tous. Ce sont des jeunes qui ont des femmes, des enfants derrière eux en Afrique. Mais ce traitement n'était pas quand même digne envers nous les Africains. Keeping people in waiting is a punishment. It generates a feeling that what people around you do has nothing to do with your life and your experiences. Long queues outside embassies of rich states in the capital of poor countries, long queues of travelers without documents along European borders or along the border between Mexico and the United States, the long queues of refugees in Dadaab camp in Kenya or Zatari camp in Jordan, All these cues are paradigmatic images of our time. Waiting for departure, waiting for asylum, waiting in transit land, waiting for a piece of paper, waiting for being deported, waiting to see the beloved ones again, day after day, months after months, year after year. It is soon too late to see again your elderly parents. It is soon too late to go to school. It is soon too late to have a child. Cher fils, je vais conclure cette partie de la page. Euh, ma vie dans les tentes prendra fin. Présentement, les gens ont commencé à libérer les lieux et il y en a aussi qui attendent d'abord pour qu'on leur donne leur argent. Et moi, je me retrouve dans ce groupe. Je dois partir 
à Napoli pour continuer encore un autre travail. Alors, on essaie de jongler comme ça pour faire joindre les deux bouts. Tout ceci dans le bien de notre, de nos familles respectives en Afrique. Seul Dieu peut nous sauver. Et j'espère que à la fin de ce calvaire, c'est pas à moi de te le narrer, mais tu as déjà l'écrit devant toi. Je ne souhaiterais pas que cette vie de merde que nous vivons vienne à passer dans ta vie future. Yes, thank you. So, um, the situations that are shown in this movie, I guess, are familiar to most of us uh, through the news media of the past years. And the, the movie highlights waiting as a situation that is marked by poverty, by lack of rights, by insecurity regarding the future, and by longing for, for one's loved ones. And of course, the situation in in Hamburg, where I worked, um, in these Assam camps, and people I met were quite different. But still, the possibility, the absence of the possibility to lead a dignified life and, and the, to plan their future could shape the lives of the people I met in Hamburg. And many of them had been living Uh, for years in and waited for years in cramped asylum camp spaces all over Europe for a decision on their asylum application or for a deportation. And uh, many, uh, including Dublin migrants such as Fatima and Allen, did not have the right to work. And while others have the right to work, uh, the hurdles to find a job for an asylum seeker or for a rejected asylum seekers are uh, very high often. So In my fieldwork, um, waiting for a secure legal status and associated rights became illuminated as a condition that is marked by an experience of time standing still on the one hand, while on the other, other hand, waiting is simultaneously an experience of time passing really rapidly because of the contrast to the passing of time and people's own sense of being stuck in their lives. And um, it is an experience of being out of sync with the surroundings, with the rhythms of society and with one's own expectations. And of course, this is something that Sharam Kujravi touches upon in the movie. It is a situation of feeling abnormality. And Alan once said it very powerful. This is not normal. Africans work all the time. He said, while well, we talked about their condition of waiting and not being able to work. And for people I met in Hamburg, living with uncertainty regarding the future, waiting for decisions they had no control over, produced feelings of anxiety and stress and emotions of doubt and, and doubt regarding one's own identity. And these emotions and the psychological and physiological condition of anxiety and stress draws attention to what I would call that rapid or accelerated time of waiting, because indeed waiting in precarious legal and material conditions is often a situation of life marked by rapidly swirling thoughts and by rapid heartbeats as cortisol and adrenaline rush in the body. And, and these bodily conditions are documented also by medical scholars and they are often also a result of precarious working conditions. And I want to stress that, that waiting for migrants is often a time of hard labor. Um, yes. Um, the man we see in the movie, who writes his son in the dark, is, um, tells a story of days filled with labor, of picking fruits in the field in Italy. And similarly, Fatima's stories on the barrack floor in Hamburg was a story of years in Europe with hard labor under precarious conditions and a, a story of struggling to make a liable, viable life for herself and her family. 
And the point I wish to make here is that the association of waiting with inactivity and empty time that we often draw might hinder us to see what is actually at stake when when we talk about my, migrants' prolonged waiting in Europe today. The, the association might actually reproduce an image of migrants as passive victims and of being in another time than researchers and policymakers or activists. But the time that researchers or migrants themselves define as waiting time is a time marked by a struggle to obtain a good life and by work, often under exploitative conditions. And it's also a time marked by mobility across borders. So this association one often makes between waiting and immobility is also one that could be questioned. And why people struggle to live a life and, and make a future for themselves, prolonged waiting in precarious conditions and insecurity regarding the future might actually affect how people relate to and work towards the future. So some scholars working with irregularized migrants have argued that the absence of legal status and the related poverty compel people to re relate primarily to the present or to the short-term future. And that is, in other words, long-term planning becomes difficult. And in my own research, I found that amongst those people I work with in Hamburg who, who live unauthorized in Germany, and we had done that for many years, life was indeed a matter of surviving in the present, solving the immediate problems of work, housing, finding something to eat uh, and to solve um, health issues and so on. And waiting in this sense was a situation that was present in relation to an undefined future. So more than a waiting for a specific outcome or a specific future, this situation can be described as one of waiting out, waiting out a condition, hoping for some kind of undefined end to the situation. Yet how situations of prolonged waiting and suspension of rights and material resources affects people's relation to the present and the future varies according to contextual factors, such as their legal status or their educational background, for instance. And for an example, in, in 2016, Germany launched a new integration act, and this made vocational training a possibility for rejected asylum seekers to obtain a residency permit. They had to first go through the whole training and successfully co complete it, although. And several of the rejected Afghan asylum seekers I worked with managed actually to enroll in a training program. And in this context, the suspension of a secure residency permit, because while they train, they are deportable in principle. So the suspension of a secure residency permit pushed their temporal orientation towards a future of having successfully completed the exam. So you could say here that this suspension in time of the possibility for a secure residency state actually um, uh, was a way of creating good students. But on the other hand, another finding in my research was that for these people, the suspension of family reunification, the fear of deportation, and the insecurity regarding the future actually also was a very big obstacle in the learning process, as it made it hard to learn and hard to concentrate. And this is a finding that we aim to explore more in the temporal project. How does temporary forms of protection affect migrants' short and long-term plans and their navigations of life in the new country? And that point also entails an important insight for those of you who encounter migrants' real work, like um, more directly, and a point that I guess most of you will know, that to understand the effects of waiting, we need to take into consideration that people live their lives in relation to loved ones elsewhere in the world. 
And these are people whose lives are not waiting. I mean, our lives are never waiting, although we are made to wait. So how waiting is experienced and lived is directly related to the well-being of people's beloved ones elsewhere in the world. And thus to understand how prolonged situations of waiting are experienced and the effects on migrants, we need to take into consideration how people live transnational lives. And, and I'm stressing this because in a lot of the literature on waiting that seeks to explore how waiting is produced through migration governance, there is a focus uh, solely on uh, national or regional, regional policy and legal developments. But to understand actually the condition of waiting, we need to look broader and to look at international political and economic occur occurrences globally. For instance, when I called my research participants last week to, because I'm still involved in this research, following up people, exploring how their lives are now after having waited for secure residency permits almost five years in Germany. When we spoke last week, uh, their situation was, of course, very, very much influenced by present developments in Afghanistan. And, um, and I want to make that point as my last point. And so although I have not been able today to touch so much upon how waiting is shaped um, um, through other developments than that of migration law, which has been my focus in today's lecture, this is an important aspect of, of, of my research and of the research we are doing in the temporal project the following years. And uh, I think with those words um, and with those hints at um, important lines of future research on the topic, I wish to thank you for your time and your patience. And I look forward to receiving your questions and talking with you. <laughs>